I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I had some questions about driving in cars and reasons that someone wants to import a vehicle, possibly as a escape option should they decide they suddenly need to leave the region. That's a reasonable thing, but let's talk about why I don't think that actually makes sense, even though the thought process or the, the final result may seem logical. And we're also going to touch a little bit on e-cigs, vapes, and tobacco when you're coming into the country. What can you do? What does it mean? And what's available? So we're going to get to that right after the bus. Before we dig in deep talking about importing vehicles and reasons that you probably don't actually want to, even though the reasons you give may make sense, like everyone has a different reason and they basically never make sense. I've had some people who did have it make sense. It's not normal though. But before that, I did have someone mention on the channel that they came into the country with an e-cig with a vaping product and it was seized by customs. And then when he got to his hotel and explained that this had happened to him, they immediately said, oh, no problem. Just go around the corner to the vape shop and buy one. So why did this happen? So this is actually important for people to know. And it's not something that we normally talk about because I don't smoke and I don't deal with it on a normal, normal basis in any way. But it is 100% forbidden for tobacco products, vaping products, e-cig products, anything of the sort to cross the border into Nicaragua. Now, you can argue that this makes sense or doesn't, but this is the law. So the uh, aduana or customs seizing those things should be expected. This is not them being arbitrary. This is not them looking for a kickback. This is their job. They are required to do this. Now, the reasons probably make sense, but it's not something people normally think about. One, we're not a tourist country. So places like Costa Rica, places like Mexico, they have a really strong need to cater to tourists. And sometimes that means that they're going to have more expensive processes or more dangerous processes because it's more important for them to make tourists feel welcome than it is to keep those tourists or their own population safe. And you see that. Obviously, this is not the only thing that drives this, but their safety numbers are nothing close to Nicaragua's. So when you're going to Costa Rica, a place that has three times the homicide and violent crime rate of Nicaragua, these are processes that they just approach differently, right? And, and they have different priorities. So that's fine, right? We're not complaining about that, but it's important to understand that Nicaragua takes safety and drug trafficking to a serious degree that no one else in the region does, literally no country in North America comes anywhere close to as serious to stopping these things from happening as Nicaragua. So their processes are a little bit different. Also, Nicaragua is not a super rich country. They can't afford to have really advanced, massive scanning machines uh, at their borders. It's just not a, a, a financial backing for that stuff. So they have to do things in a practical way. So here in Nicaragua, they're really concerned about people smuggling in different types of drugs and tobacco and vaping products are a really good way to hide other drugs coming into the country. So if you want to control those things, they, they can't afford to have chemical scanners and all those things at every possible border crossing. So the options are either look the other way and leave that loophole in the transit system or simply ban it and then allow people to buy it in country. Why can you buy it in country? Because the importers that are doing that are vetted. They're being scanned at the border. They have single points of entry. They're able to, for much less money, and they're able to charge the vendors for that. If they were to scan at the border, they would take up a whole bunch of time. It would be very costly. It would make the experience of tourists coming into the country far worse for everyone else because they would have to wait longer in line, and already those lines are pretty long. So they have taken the action of simply banning it. It's not a big deal. Panama also bans it, right? The difference is once you're in Nicaragua, you're allowed to buy it again. And in Panama, you're not. Last time I was in Panama, unless this has changed, they're a tobacco-free country. They made a really big deal about it that that stuff was banned. That doesn't mean people don't smuggle it in. It doesn't mean people don't do it at home. But officially, they're not allowed to. So you can't just go around the corner and buy that stuff, nor can you import it. So that's really important to understand that everyone takes this differently and it's something you just need to look up ahead of time. There's often, because Americans are so used to a culture where transiting with different types of uh, substances like that between regions is just accepted because that's American culture. In much of the world, those aren't things that can cross borders. So if you're traveling with tobacco, uh, it, you know almost anywhere you're safe that you can buy it when you're in country. But when you're traveling with it, you should always expect to look up uh, each border that you're going to cross and see if that's something that's allowed to cross the border. Now, of course, you're not going to get in trouble bringing it into Nicar Nicaragua. They are completely reasonable about the fact that they know that people travel with this stuff. They know that people don't know. They know you're not like going to get in trouble. They're just supposed to take it away. And theoretically, taking away a partial package of cigarettes, taking away a partially used vape that you, you know, accidentally brought with you on a plane, 
while that's annoying, it's also should never be the end of the world, right? It's an extreme luxury item. It's a thing very few people can really afford, especially in Nicaragua. This is a very luxury item here, even though smoking is pretty popular. It's it's an extreme use of, of financial resources in most cases. So it's not the kind of thing that they view as, a, it's not a necessary thing, right? So so that's why it's treated that way. It's it's just a practical means uh, to attempting to to curtail drug trafficking in the country using practical methodologies. Okay, so let's get to today's real question about bringing in, importing a car into the country. So I'm gonna read this because that is the best way to do it. So Goats Out for Justice says, what if I drive my car there and park it while there and just use a quad or something to get around town? If I did decide to stay, then maybe look at import a car uh, like a Toyota Sienna. I might love Nicaragua or I might hate it, but having a reliable vi reliable vehicle makes me feel safe, like I can leave anytime, anywhere I want. I really need my escape pod for emotional support and safety just in case. So it's important he's recognizing this is for emotional support. It is not for logical reasons. So, okay, let's work with that. So there's a couple things we got to say here. One, what if I drive my car there? That's always the wrong answer, right? Um, I understand. There are cases, and I've considered doing it. Like you're bringing a lot of people, you're bringing a lot of pets, you really just like road tripping, all those things kind of make sense. The problem is if you cross the border, and every border between wherever you're coming from, we're just going to guess the United States because he wrote this in English, but it could be coming from anywhere from Panama to Canada. Uh, if you're coming into any country along that path, you have to deal with importing your vehicle to transit that country. In some cases, that's very simple. It's just some quick paperwork, right? You explain at the border, well, yes, I'm, I'm importing, but I'm, I, you know, I'm coming into Guatemala. I'm going to export in Honduras in several hours when I get there. Cool. That, not a problem, right? When you're coming to Nicaragua, you are not transiting. You're not going on to another country. You're coming into Nicaragua, and then you're doing a final import. Now, if you're only coming in for a week or something, then absolutely. If you're coming in as a true tourist with zero possibility of staying any length of time, and you're just here for a few weeks, and it happened to be convenient to drive instead of fly, then that importation of a vehicle is relatively easy. You know, it's kind of like a tourist visa for a car. Oh, I'm just coming in on a tourist visa. You can get 30 days. For most people, that works fine. And then you can drive your car around the country. The system is designed to make this action relatively simple because that is a reasonable tourist action. There are also really good systems for when you are an official resident with with permanent residency, that's the ones we talk about, right? When you're talking about uh, retirement residency, investment residency, uh, foreign income residency, all those processes, they allow you to own a car in country, no problem whatsoever. They even allow you a one-time import of a car at, at really good uh, facilitation, right? And so, so all of that is great. What is a problem is in the in-between. If you decide to be a permanent tourist and don't go for residency, and, and I do recommend that people do this all the time, so this is not like some weird thing that I'm saying. This is the process we often say is become this permanent tourist. If you do that, cars are not permitted to do that. So if you come in with a car as a tourist and you decide, hey, I wanna stay, your car is actually the problem. It's the thing that is going to give you safety issues because you now have to deal with a car you have imported that was required to leave long before you will be required to leave. You can stay 180 days with rarely an exception to getting that, and then you can just do your turnaround, come right back in. But your car can't do things like that. It One, it's not going to get 180 days. Two, it can't just do border runs. Three, the other countries you would have to take it to won't necessarily accept it because the they don't want to import your car either. Cars are a big problem. So if you drive down with a car, one thing you have guaranteed is that you will have a problem. That is a, that is a guarantee. Now, some people, it is worth it because they really want a specific car. They absolutely know they're not going to leave the country and they're willing to deal with whatever comes up, right? Exactly the things you're saying you're not do it, right? You're not 100% sure that you're going to stay in the country. Well, that should eliminate driving a car down right there, unless you know it's just 30 days. Now, can you extend a car stay? Yes, I know people who've done it. I don't know anyone who's done it and not been ridiculously sorry, right? Now, there's some people who are new to it and they're still like, yeah, it seems like it was okay, right? But I don't know anyone who's done it for a length of time and not been really, really sorry. I know people that it was a major trigger for them deciding to move to another country because, and they knew they had set themselves up and created a situation they could not sustain, right? So really, Unless you're temporarily driving in, like if you want to drive down and you want to bring your family and you've got a bunch of pets, you're going to bring them all down, 
great. You drive down, you do, for, if you're coming from the US, the 60 hour drive, you get here, you drop everyone off, you take a few days, maybe two weeks to really rest up. And then you get in that car and you drive it back to wherever you came from and sell it, store it, whatever. Excellent. That is exactly what the system is designed for. Every country along the path is designed to handle that. That is the appropriate use of driving into the country as designed by everyone involved. If your goal is to drive down and simply keep your vehicle here, there are processes to attempt to do this. But I do not know of anyone who long term has done this and had it work out in any way that was good. Right. It's just it's such a horrible thing because you're doing a forced import with temporary like it's just a combination of things that should never happen. And if you were doing this in other countries, you'd be like, oh, no, that's crazy. No, of course, that doesn't work out. Right. I'm going to drive my car from Nicaragua. I've got a car that I own in Nicaragua or worse that I buy in Nicaragua and then drive it to the U.S. And then once I'm in the U.S., just keep saying I'm a tourist until then it's been here for a really long time and now I'm in trouble for importing a car without going through the paperwork of importing a car because you're actually importing a car. Like that's, that's actually what's happening when you drive into a country. And it doesn't matter if you say, I'm not going to drive it. That has nothing to do with the scenario. You have imported a car. This is where people don't often think because you're used to say the United States or Canada going between provinces or states that you're just traveling around a region. But when you're going from the U.S. into Mexico or Mexico into Guatemala, Guatemala into Honduras, Honduras into Nicaragua, as a vehicle crosses that border, it is being imported into that country, in some cases, very temporarily. So there's, like I said, processes for allowing you to transit with a temporary import paperwork that then allows you to export it when you get to the end. And it's generally not a big deal. But when you come into a country and you're not transiting, that is a full on by the book absolutely import in every sense of the word. It's not kind of an import. It's not a special case import. It is the textbook example of single item importation. And so you need to eventually deal with all of the hassles that come with importing if you're allowed to. And if you don't get permission to do it, then you have to deal with getting the car out of the country because you're dealing with something that's not allowed to be there. It's the same as if a person came in and their visa expired and they had to leave. Basically, your car could get deported at any time. So Either you have to somehow manage to permanently import it, which is not something you want to do because you don't have permission to do it, and you can't do that as a tourist, or get your residency, then import it. Some people do do that. If you come down, definitely get your residency right away and are able to take the car from a tourist vehicle into a full import with your residency process. Okay, that is a way to do it, and you have to, but you have to make a commitment to that because you have to get your residency pretty quickly, and you have to import that car as part of the residency, and that is a huge, now that car belongs in Nicaragua. Now getting it out, which is exactly the thing you're saying you might want to do, you may have problems with. Now you'd have to export it to get it out of the country, a full export, not just a transit export, which could cause problems for you elsewhere, wherever you try to end up. Owning a car is a problem in many cases. It feels, because we come from North America, where we have giant swaths of area where you can move transparently without any border zones, owning a car feels like freedom. But when you get to small countries, especially like Central America, where you have very small jurisdictions with hard borders, even though Honduras, for example, is a soft border for people, it is a hard border for vehicles, with hard borders all over the place, you can't go any distance without that car being a risk and an encumbrance. The thing that emotionally feels like it's giving you freedom and safety is anything but. It is giving you risk. It is giving you danger. It is giving you inflexibility. So if you want the flexibility to be able to just get out, to have access to your money, to don't import a car, that is the worst thing you could do for getting to those end results. Basically, if you're in a position where you're not 100% sure that you're definitely leaving within, say, 30, maybe 60 days, or you are definitely staying indefinitely, you, you have confidence you're going to get your residency and you're definitely going to import the vehicle you bring down, then driving a car down is should just be off the table. That alone should just eliminate it. There should be no further discussion because there's really no reasonable exception to that being a bad idea. Now, the next piece that was said was, well, what if I came down and parked it, right? That means nothing. The fact that you parked it, whether you register, don't register, import, don't, none of that matters. So I don't know what what the, the end goal there was, but it just doesn't help anything. Um, and then use a quad to get around town. So just be clear, quads are not legal on the roads, just like in the US. Now, this is a little bit more of the Wild West. 
it's very much more small town. So if you live in the right places, like a small beach town and never want to go any farther, like you never need to go to a grocery store, then they often look the other way. And if you drive just along the beach road, often quads are allowed. It's not official, but you know, as long as you're not getting in any trouble, as long as you're not, you know, annoying the police or whatever, in many cases, you'll be okay. But at any moment, the police could stop you from doing that because you're not allowed to. It's not a registered vehicle. It's not supposed to be on the road. Uh, you're not legally able to do that as a tourist because you, if you're going to drive it on the road, you have to register it. You can't register as a tourist and you can't rent those for use on the road because they're not allowed on the road, right? There's just a lot of things. A lot of people do it and get away with it, but you're taking risks because officially you're not allowed to do that. And you definitely can't go into the cities or anything. They will certainly not allow that in Leon or Granada or Messiah or Managua or Chinandega or any place like that. Out in like Ponaloya, yeah, a few people do it. But if any number of people do it with any regularity, it's going to cause real problems and they'll have to shut it down. And all it takes is one business or one local who decides you're being a problem and they go to the police and go, you know, this is illegal. They don't have that registered on the road and they're just a tourist. You got to do something. And the police will kind of be in a rough position where they're like, eh, yeah, we actually are supposed to do something. So yeah, often you get away with it, but it just, it just adds a lot of risks. And then you have this parked car to deal with during all that time as well. Now you said if you decided to stay, you would look at importing something like a to Toyota Sienna. Now Toyotas are great. I have one myself, although mine is junk. But <laughs> when, so this adds another complication to the story. Um, now I understand once we're breaking this down, I'm sure you're like, well, then I wouldn't want to do those things. But for people who are reading the comments or just running through these processes, trying to justify, and that's really what it is. People have it just like they really want to buy houses early. They really want to invest without researching. People seem to have this intrinsic desire to import vehicles at any cost, right? Like it just feels like they, they have to. And so people look for justifications to come up with reasons to import vehicles, which you shouldn't be doing. You should be saying, how can I avoid the effort and cost and annoyance and problems of importing a vehicle? Is that something I absolutely have to do? And basically never do you have to do that. Never is it beneficial. Almost never is it beneficial. So you shouldn't be ever looking for reasons to import. That is a nonsensical process. If you have a situation that arises that actually makes you import, fine, but you should never be seeking to import, but that is what people tend to do. There's this emotional drive to import, no matter how irrational it is, and we're just like this, but there's some things about Nicaragua that make these things happen, and I can't figure out why. So uh, if you do decide you want to stay, well, first of all, in your example, you've already imported a vehicle somehow, or it's stuck here, so you already have a vehicle. What are you doing with that one? Why would you be importing another one? And that first one you brought in, when you become a resident, which is implied in deciding you want to stay indefinitely uh, or in the wanting to import. You can only import as a resident. So to say you plan to import obviously implies you've become a resident. Well, that first one that you brought down is required to be imported under that residency and you only get one. So you can't import another car at all. But let's assume you skip that first step and you, you know, watch my video and you decide, oh, no, I shouldn't drive down or at least not drive down and leave my car. I'm going to come down, live without a car. And then at some point when I get residency in weeks or months or years, whatever, makes sense for you, then I'm going to import a car like a Toyota Sienna. Okay, now the question becomes, why would you import a car unless you already own it? And there's a really special case where like you have the perfect car, it has uh, no resale value in the United States or wherever, and you can get it somehow here at reasonable cost. And, and it does make sense in country and you already have it. And you're at that moment where you get that one time import as a resident. Well, okay, maybe it makes sense to bring a car once all those things have fallen into place but you would never plan on that, right? It just comes together at some point. If you can, under normal circumstances, if you have a car in the US, you wanna sell it in the US and then buy one in Nicaragua. And there's a couple of reasons for this. One, importing is risky. There's a lot of opportunity for something to go wrong in the import process. Like you have to ship it in a, in a boat, it costs a fortune, it falls off the boat. You have to drive it a really long way. That's expensive and potentially dangerous. There's just a lot of things that you may want to avoid. If you do manage to import a car, now it's a vehicle that wasn't purchased in Nicaragua. So you definitely don't have any warranty. Anything that resembles a warranty is just out the window. And you can't import a really old car. Nicaragua doesn't allow old ones to be imported. So this is, you're definitely importing a recent car that should have some warranty or some protections in the United States. You're waiving those. So the value of that car drops dramatically simply by leaving the United States with it in an importation mode. Once you get to Nicaragua, you have only two options. Either you have imported a vehicle that already exists in Nicaragua, which implies you could have gotten it cheaper here and much easier here. And 
The opposite is you get one that doesn't exist here. Now you have a car that doesn't have parts available locally. We have limited parts availability. Even for the cars we have, it's not the best. So you really, really carefully when choosing a car in Nicaragua, base your decisions off of what is available widely in country. So things like a Toyota Corolla, a Toyota Yaris, a Toyota Land Cruiser, a Toyota Hilux, a Toyota Hiace, those vehicles from Toyota, you can safely feel that you can own without problems. But other Toyota vehicles may not be widely available in country, mechanics aren't that familiar with them, and parts are maybe only available in Managua, if at all. Something like a Sienna, which I've never seen in the country, you're looking at potentially having to fly in parts from Japan every time you get repairs done. And that's completely doable if you're an automotive collector and you're willing to let your car not be a reliable thing and just get it fixed when you can. But if your goal is reliability or safety, which is specifically what you mentioned, that should rule out importing and vehicles that are not standard in country right off the bat because that's how you get your reliability and safety is by having them be super standard. There are a number of car makers that are available in country here with good part supply. Uh, Toyota, Nissan, Mazda, uh, a couple Chinese makers, um, and, and a couple Korean makers, Hyundai, Kia, right? That's about it. And that's a decent selection. You have plenty to choose from, but there's only a handful. There's a ton that may seem reasonable, Ford and Chevy and whatever. You have to rule them out if you care about price and reliability and safety because you just can't get them repaired here, not reliably. Now, some people drive Corvettes in the country. Some people have Lamborghinis and stuff. They're super rare, but they do exist. But people understand when they get them that there's no way that they can keep them maintained and there's lots of time that just won't be available on the road. And if anything goes wrong, they could be years without being able to drive them. They accept that when they get them. But that's what you're looking at for a Toyota Sienna. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, maybe Siennas have parts in country but I've never seen one, so assume that they don't. And so the same thing happens with the cars that are available here. You have to get the models that are available here and the years that are available here, not just the car makers, not just the marks. Uh, and so you have to put those things together for reliability and safety. So all of that says, don't import a car. You should be, for reliable and safety, running away from the thought process of wanting to import. Owning a car, maybe, but only under specific circumstances, because no matter what, you're going to have to deal with that car. Should there be an emergency and you need to leave the country for whatever reason, and you want to do so by car, you have a couple problems. Well, one, what if you can't do so by car? You decide you need to fly out of the country. Now, you have a car you have to deal with. You're not generally allowed to just leave it behind. Of course, you can abandon it, but that means you're abandoning it, and it may cause problems for you to ever return to the country and it could be a very large investment that you're simply going to leave behind. Those are generally not things that we connect with safety. If you're worried about just the flexibility of life that you can pack up and run away at any moment. And I've had to do this from Nicaragua because we had a family emergency and we had to pack up our lives and go back to the United States. Not because anything happened in Nicaragua, but because something happened in the United States and we just had to go. But it was it's the same no matter what. It was an emergency and we had to go. And because we didn't own a house, didn't own a car, we were out in hours. We were able to run to the airport, get on a plane, and be with the family that needed us in half a day. That was amazing. That was a scramble, but it was amazing that we were able to do that. And it's one of the things that led us to choosing Nicaragua as our permanent home, because we know we can always get back home really quickly should family need it, some emergency arise. If you own a car, you own a house, those things make that a lot more difficult. If you have a lease or a, a renting of a house and you have to go suddenly, hey, pay your bills remotely, tell them to come take it, right? <sighs> Look, sorry, I can pay you the cost for the car. I can pay you the, my rent, my lease on the car, but I can't drive it back for you to pick it up because I had to go it's an emergency. Keys are on my desk and here's the address of the car, go pick it up. Yeah. That might be annoying. Yeah, they might be angry with you, but you haven't like stolen a car. You aren't stuck with something that's illegal. You're not not renewing registration. You're not in trouble with the police or anything like that. So it's a uh, it. it keeping yourself flexible is an important part of being flexible. It's an interesting emotional response that when often, and we get this a ton, and we're going to do some videos about real estate, a lot of people, especially retirees, think of encumbrances as making them free. And I don't know where this mindset comes from, but people tend to think that owning things like owning houses, owning cars, somehow give us freedom. And this is something that people selling houses and selling cars, of course, push really, really hard. But logically, the more things you own, the less flexible, the less free you are. And so if you own a car, own a house, those things will hold you back either by simply tying up your finances and not giving you the financial power to do the things that you want to do, or by making it very difficult or possibly impossible for you to travel when you feel that you need to. So those are things to think about keeping yourself light and loose and able to move rapidly over borders, wherever you need to go by whatever media makes sense 
may be something that actually solves the thing that you're looking to solve, right? Stability, reliability. If you do own a car and you decide you have to leave the country quickly, obviously if you've decided you had to go by boat or plane, that car will be a problem. If you decide you need to go by land, it may still be a problem. Under certain circumstances where you're a resident and you own a car and it's registered in your own name, you're able to drive out of the country. But you then have to deal with, if you're doing that on a permanent basis, importing it into another country, and no country is necessarily going to accept that import. So it may create a problem for you in the opposite direction. Whereas if you're using taxis or public transportation, you can do those same things and you are free to do whatever you need in those bordering countries. So I'm not saying that there's no circumstance where you want to own a car. Certainly you often do, especially if you're a resident and I own a car myself. So I understand that there are reasons to own a car, but I don't own the car under the purpose of being flexible. I own it because I need to do things in country and I have businesses and I need to travel around and shoot things and shoot the show in different locations. And I want to be able to cross the border and explore the region with my camera gear and stuff. And I have to move my kids around. I have the car for those reasons. And that totally makes sense. And lots of people have reasons why they need vehicles. I'm not saying you shouldn't own a vehicle, but carefully evaluate why you want to get a vehicle and the way that you want to get it. For 99% of us who live in any country, you want to buy your cars in country, even though they may have a higher tax rate, they may have a lower selection. Those are all factors you have to consider that importing has its own cost, has its own risks, and no matter where you are in the world, having a car that is easily serviced and parts available and knowledge is available of it and able to be resold in the country that you're in is generally the most important factors. But the last thing they said, and I've already touched on this, but <clears throat> he doesn't know if he's going to love or hate Nicaragua or be indifferent to it, presumably. And it seems like having a car means he can leave any time, but that's exactly what it doesn't mean. In order to have a car, it means you've made a big commitment. You're already to some degree trapped, not completely. You can always leave, but that car may be the thing that stops you going over other borders. Well, I'm moving to your country. Oh, but you have a car. How do you plan to do that? Well, I plan to import it into wherever it is you want to go, Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala, whatever you name the place that you're driving to. You now have a car and you need them to accept that car. If they decide not to accept that car, even though they might accept you, you're stuck turning around and heading back to Nicaragua. And so that car could become the thing that stops you from being able to choose where you want to go. So owning a car, using a car that you own as a means of traveling to a new country fundamentally means risk and inflexibility. That should always be something when you're a traveler, you're just a backpacker, you're living out of your car, you're driving from place to place, you're just a tourist, you're flexible to go wherever it makes sense. Yes, that is a different thing. When you are looking at relocation and you're like, oh, I went to this country, I decided I didn't like it, I'm gonna drive on to another one. You have a problem, that car is now something you have to deal with and you could, like my friends who did this into Nicaragua, spend your entire life dealing with that car and never get to experience the place you came to because you don't have all of your permissions in place. It doesn't, it's not a logical vehicle for what you're doing. The process is never supposed to happen that way. And so you're in this, this limbo zone of being stuck outside of the jurisdictions that own the vehicle and you may not have permission to return to the ones where the vehicle is required to be you may not have the means to sell it where you need to because remember if you go to another country you're not allowed to sell a car that came from another country i know of no country that allows you to do that you have to return and sell it there or do a full import before selling it so the idea that you're just going to abandon a car or sell a car and those aren't things you're allowed to do some people get away with it sometimes but it is a crime it is especially you have to worry about tax fraud and money laundering Moving a vehicle between jurisdictions, if that vehicle is worth over $10,000, is a necessary mandatory reporting for money laundering laws. And uh, in many cases, what people do, you know, oh, I bought a car here, I'm going to take it here, I'm just going to sell it to somebody. That's hiding a major transaction and technically qualifies as money laundering. It qualifies in the U.S., qualifies in Nicaragua, qualifies in every other country in the region. So you really have to think through working around those processes. They're, they're, they're there for specific reasons. And I know when you're a consumer and you're just... It seems like, well, I can just buy a car and drive it places. It's my car. It doesn't work that way. Cars are like houses and you can't just transparently ship them between jurisdictions because they have insurance tied to them. They have risk and they have ownership and they have VIN numbers and they have all kinds of things. Cars are simply too large of an item that you can't move them around like you can your suitcase. So just to recap, there are very few scenarios where we would really recommend coming down and importing a vehicle and very few where we'd recommend driving down in a vehicle. They certainly exist. There are special cases, but they are not 
for most people, and for most reasons that people think they're going to want to do it, they should step back and evaluate, is this really something that you want? Does it really make sense, or is it an emotional reaction that it just feels good, and you don't actually have really solid, this will solve this problem for me? Because it's not going to get you across the border any easier, it's not gonna allow you to leave more quickly, it's not gonna give you flexibility or financial freedom. It may solve some other problem, absolutely, but really stop and think what is the exact thing that you're trying to work for. And, and when we're talking to people who are looking at relocating time and time again, what we find is a few things. There's some patterns of bad behavior or, or self-defeating behavior that are encouraged, whether it's just a cultural thing or an emotional thing, or there are predators here in country that are trying to make, and we're not talking terrible predators, just people looking to make a little bit of money off of you, trying to sell you an extra car, sell you an extra house, sell you an extra service. So watch out for that stuff. Are you being encouraged to do bad things by people who just are looking to get into your wallets, that may not be great, right? And it's also important to understand when you're moving to a new country, there's a, if you're going to a really big country, if you're coming to the United States, you have a lot more freedom, meaning you have a lot of flexibility as to the ways in which you can enter the country. Maybe you could ship your, your stuff in a bunch of different ways. You could buy your stuff a bunch of different ways. You can get a vehicle because it's a big, big country and there's so many people doing different things and so many offices and and officials and and just ways to do things when you're coming to a place like Nicaragua there's only a couple ports of entry there's only a couple people that you're going to deal with during the immigration process every little thing is very small scale there aren't uh this the, there isn't the scale necessary to have all these different processes worked out for you and so so edge cases don't get treated well not that they don't want to just that it's completely impractical. It's so expensive to try to deal with one-off situations. There are very straightforward, very obvious, very logical, very just normal ways to move into a new country, ways to approach it. And that's almost always what you want to do, especially when coming to a smaller country like Nicaragua. You want to take advantage of being part of the mainstream, take advantage of things being quick and easy and simple and handled for you. And yes, it may not be tuned or customized just perfectly for the way that you want to do it. You really want to bring in that one car, right? I've got a friend had a really nice sports car, muscle car back in the United States. Did he want to bring it down? Absolutely he did. Would it cost him an arm and a leg? Yes, it would have. Now that he's here, he realizes it wouldn't have fit down most of the roads. It would have bottomed out everywhere in town. There's reasons why it doesn't make sense to have them here and why people don't sell them here. But until you live here, it may feel like, wow, of course I want to bring down my Lamborghini. That's who wouldn't want to have one. I already own it. I don't want to sell it. I'm going to lose money. I want to just have it, right? I bought it for a reason. Oh, wait. There's no road in the country where it's going to be able to go very fast. There's no place where I'm going to make it down without bottoming out. Oh, I'm going to ruin it in no time in all the salt air. Maybe I don't want it, right? Maybe you don't. You want to get here, be normal, do the things that everyone does. And then once you're here, once you're a resident, once you spend some time, in almost all cases, this is what it comes down to. Get down here, get to know what it's actually like then start making these big decisions. How am I gonna get a car? Don't don't lead with how do you get a car here? Like, it, it's really tempting, and, and everyone does this. I'm going to find a house I want, I'm gonna find a business I wanna invest in, I'm gonna ship my car, and then I'm gonna decide what country all those things are gonna happen in. Or I'm gonna choose the country I'm going to based on where I did those things. Like, it, it's completely cart before the horse. Start with pick the country, get a rental, find the city you like, work, these details until you really know what it is you're going to do, then make these big decisions in life, cars and houses and, and investments and all those things. You have to have knowledge for all these things if you're going to do them well. It's just There's just so much to go wrong when you lead with trying to do something that people who live here generally would not do, right? And I know when you don't live here, you don't know that people generally wouldn't do it, but it's easy to say, I'm moving to a new country. Should I ship a car there? It doesn't matter where you're going in the world. It doesn't matter what the scenario is. The answer is always going to be, um, no. That's really weird. That's a really strange thing to do. Again, if you have a Lamborghini and you're, you're moving to France where people have Lamborghinis and drive around, okay, right? And if you own a Lamborghini, you probably have some other resources, so it may be different. But when you're talking about anything involving normal cars, shipping them to a new country because you think you might want to move there falls into a nowhere in the world ever is that a process you'd probably want to do, right? So think about it in the global context. And if it doesn't apply anywhere else, yeah, Nicaragua could be unique. But assume in situations like that, that it's not unique and that normal uh, moving and relocation and house buying and car buying and imports and exports and all those things are going to apply 
and you don't want to make it a special case and do things that you just don't do when moving. So thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. I hope that helps everyone understand a little bit more just why we recommend at least waiting, if not never, doing these kinds of things. Importing a car is a very special case scenario that probably won't apply to you. Uh, if you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Miller. That comes directly to me and helps make me able to afford to import cars. Just kidding, I'm not going to do that. Actually, I might. I do have a case. I will explain in, a, in an upcoming video at some point the car that I'm really interested in importing, but I have a really specific reasons for doing it. I've been here for a long time. I know the car. I know where I'm going to import it from. I've addressed all the reasons that it makes sense to get. I've worried about the reasons that it doesn't make sense to get. And I plan to use it for the channel and I know how I'm going to handle maintenance and it's not my only car and it's really, really cheap. And it's a special case that only fits because of my resident. It's just a lot of things. But if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so. Buymeacoffee.com slash Scott L. Miller. And of course, post on social media, tell a friend, family member about the show, get them hooked, get them watching, help them to learn more about relocation and Central America, Latin America, the whole living abroad, digital nomad lifestyle, all those things that we cover here. Plus just another day in the life of Scott because um, maybe, maybe I'm interesting. I don't know. I will see all of you tomorrow. And I'll do my best to pop up four videos on the screen. If you could pick one of these or one that comes up on the side or one of the other ones that YouTube recommends just going on to another video, especially one of mine, but even one that isn't, helps tell YouTube that you appreciate this show.